So, hi everybody, thank you very much for being here. I happen to be the second presenter here, but I also co-chair this uh, conference and after that uh, we started, Mike and I, some five, six months ago and we were very, very lucky to be, um, you know, fully supported by the School of Architecture to sponsor this event and to bring this lineup of wonderful speakers um, all for free for you uh, this year, so I'm not sure about it future years. We had workshops and we have full exhibit. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. So uh, my talk will be centered around my effort at the school this past two years. Um, my curiosity about the role of computers in architecture started very early. My master research at Auckland University in New Zealand in the late 1990s investigated how materials were represented in CAD software and how they were used in the context of the design studio. At the time, I really found a great limitation with the commercial software, and I thought the reason must be because, the, because of those who built these tools were mostly engineers and not architects. So I decided to take matters into my own hands, so, so to speak, and uh, I did a graduate degree. I went back to study computer um, science and specialized in computer graphics and, uh, at the University of Texas and uh, started working with Robert McNeil and Associates shortly after my graduation about 13 years ago. I started working actually at a time when computers were mainly used as a drafting machines. And through the years, I really witnessed firsthand the rise of computational methods in architecture. Despite my focus on tool building and supporting practitioners through these years, and I still actively do that, I always took interest in education. In 2010, I put together the Essential Mathematics for Computational Design to help designers fill the knowledge gap in mathematics and geometry. Uh, during my past two and a half years, almost here at a new school, I have been developing a new model for an essential education for computational design, and hence the title of my talk here. So early in education, actually, many prominent architects and researchers wondered about the use of computers in architecture since the 19, early 1970s, but there was no outlet for a wider application, and their ideas stayed mostly in research. Ideas such as shape grammars, pattern language, and evolutionary architecture, to name a few. And instead, what started to gain popularity was commercial CAD uh, software, right? And CAD actually, uh, I don't know if all of you know, it actually stands for computer-aided drafting. And this is what, how, how the whole thing CAD came about. And, um, you know, the use of CAD in documenta documentation and the practice in the, of architecture became really dominant at that period in the, in, in the, in the 80s, I think. Um, CAD started to make its way into education mainly because it was an employable skill. That's how it first came and came introduced into the schools of architecture. Along with it came a new generation of 3D modelers that focused on presentation, rendering, and animation. Um, other than a few exceptions, actually, CAD was not taught in the context of design and building. And because of that, the results were not really pleasing, right? I'm sure you, all of you educators, students, have seen something like that. Students were given the means to produce complex forms without the knowledge of how to build them, nor any informed discussion about the impact on the space and design, right? Many educators decided at the time that computer modeling brought complexity without meaning. And the solution to them was to limit the use of computers in design. These negative views still linger to this day among educators around the world, actually. 
just from this bad experience and the separation, in my opinion, between the CAD uh, classes and the design studio and theory. While schools were busy ignoring computers, a small section of architectural practices approached the new technology very differently. They saw an opportunity to realize complex forms never built before. They teamed up with engineers and builders and devoted necessary resources for research and development, an effort that the um, architectural education and schools actually missed the opportunity to, to lead on. Um, and the results were breathtaking. Architecture witnessed the emergence of new forms that captured the imagination of the architectural community and the public alike. Most importantly, the new building processes that emerged out of this process has, has, has really proved its validity. They changed how computers were used and perceived in architecture. This is was a huge collaborative effort among all building professionals to not just build complex forms, but in the, in the way of doing that, they really develop processes to support using computation in a whole different way. All right. So now at that point, the pressure was on the tool builders which I'm part of that community, to develop intuitive programming tools that are suitable for creative designers. New text-based applications were introduced, but it was not until Grasshopper for Rhinoceros with its visual programming and algorithmic methods became popular among designers. The open and accessible nature of Grasshopper also meant that people Involved, it really meant that people could easily integrate a new functionality into Grasshopper. The community involvement transformed, transformed the Grasshopper from what started as a parametric tool into a whole new rich parametric environment. And what I'm going to show you here is just a few clips to show you what, uh, for example, here a typical Maximize. So what you see here is a is a, is a, a student or project that is actually trying to create a responsive a, a responsive uh, and um, roof system for a stadium, and it really just create. Uh, a whole uh, a process and using computational methods to generate this roof uh, facade. And you'll see how go he goes between Grasshopper and Rhino to design this um, roof system and see how it could be con controlled with a few parameters. And these para this is where the word uh, or the term parametric design, I guess, came from. And um, And on the right side, you see the script that's actually controlling the model that's showing on the left side. And now once that model is set up, then they will actually use um, you know, the position of the sun to control how that roof system varies. Um, but it doesn't have to solve the whole design. Another uh, uh, way to look at it, and I'm not going to maximize the screen here, Thank you. Um, is that maybe to solve just a little detail. So now here they are trying to create a reflector, um, and uh, they use uh, parametric methods uh, to uh, experiment with different variations 
and then decide on the one that will actually work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I was talking about expanding the parametric tool um, into a parametric environment, you see different people starting to plug more intelligence into the um, computational environment. And now this is more of a, a physically um, controlled uh, modeling um, using Kangaroo in this um, case. So are all these examples by people uh, that have used uh, the parametric environment or the computational methods to create a variety of um, functionality that expanded. Mm. So back to education, now that um, So, well, the utility of computational methods has become a reality in the practice. In a practice, the schools are still struggling with how to introduce them into their problems, into their programs. Well, frankly, many educators are still not convinced about the value of computational methods in design education. On the other hand, algorithmic thinking and computational methods are not trivial to teach and requires specialized resources and careful planning. And it does not help that software and fabrication equipment are changing rapidly, which poses a financial and planning challenge as schools. But more importantly, there are no recommended guidelines or standards that can help institutions to decide what and how to include about computational methods in their programs. So the urgent question was, how can we address the challenges without compromising the quality of education? But how can we define even the essential education for computational design? This is a question that occupied me and prompted me to go back into education the past two and a half years to uh, try to experiment with some ideas and come up with the models that might work. Uh, I started really my effort by identifying five core components that I thought were key for a comprehensive understanding of computational methods in architecture. There are many other areas of specialization that the program can be expanded to. These five areas include the foundation knowledge of mathematics and geometry, the, um, the process, the logical thinking, the algorithmic thinking, to be able to use these methods in the context of design cycle, design and analysis, to make a really strong connection between the digital and the physical, and also to found all this effort into a very solid theory study to understand the meaning of why we are doing um, and, and how we can maximize the use of it. So, oops, I'm going backwards. So that's bring me to, new, to, 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 new, to my effort at a new school of architecture and design. At a new school, we wanted to introduce a program uh, in a way that does not disrupt the current curriculum and at the same time provide all five components of the essential education in computational design. The program was structured as a sequence of three elective classes that met four hours a week over three quarters. The first class focuses on the foundation knowledge of mathematics and geometry. The second uses parametric design and digital fabrication to examine the link between the digital and the physical in, in a design context. And the third class further develop um, uh, their knowledge, students' knowledge, through analysis and optimization. 
through the, throughout the program, the students were gradually developing their skills in algorithmic thinking and programming through incremental step. As we can see in this slide, that the first um, iteration of their design was, you know, what's what's featured in in A, which is just the mass of their tower, and they slowly started to transition from examining the paneling system, uh, a system that is actually adaptive and one that is controlled by some constraint, could be environmental constraint. So in the process, they are developing their knowledge in, in, in algorithms, right? And um, so, uh, and the other element was the hands-on experience on fabrication. So from left to right, you see how the students transitioned from an abstract mass into one that is actually explored through a variety of fabrication methods and how the design evolved throughout that process. And what we did is also we put a design context where the students develop their ideas and use their adaptive systems or um, and computational methods to be able to come up with the projects that was meaningful in a design context and we had discussions about that. Um, and as part of the design process, they went to the structural environmental analysis to further develop their, uh, their designs. And we see here a student project where uh, the study of a glare uh, has informed their, uh, their design and how they transitioned from left to right here through exploring the different variations and options of their mass. The fourth component or the fifth component that was present in the, in the um, uh, program was also the study of theory. So the students went through studying um, the precedent, the processes, the representation, um, uh, media, and all these uh, things and have a critical view towards all these um, questions and uh, research. Um, that's my final slide. And what I want to leave you with is that the essential education proposed here in computational design helps students reach a level of fluency with digital design tools and fabrication methods that they can utilize appropriately at any stage of the design process. The implementation at a new school has shown very promising results both on an individual level and in regard to the influence on the school culture in general. Most students continued their pursuit of the field through the, their design studio projects and research. Their work provided a precedent for other students and faculty members and started to educate them about the value of computational methods in architecture. A new culture of a critical understanding emerged, is emerging within the school, which was exactly what the program has hoped for. Thank you very much for your.